Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming to uh, hear the update uh, on the story. Um, as usual, it's been a very, another busy year uh, for our team. Uh, I'll be talking about Crawford, but uh, some of the big developments this year are in terms of the Timmins Nickel District. So I really want to emphasize you know, that Crawford on its own uh, is one of the world's largest uh, nickel sulfide deposits. But what we're unlocking here in Timmins is really the world's largest nickel sulfide district. Uh, that should be the new basis for nickel sulfide supply uh, for the next 100 years uh, or so. Uh, in terms of uh, key developments, uh, we welcomed uh, a new shareholder uh, since the last time we spoke, uh, Take Watagalu Nation, uh, is taking $20 million of their own capital um, and investing that in that in the company. Uh, in terms of the work our team's done, building links with communities in the area, you know, that's a, that's a very a great endorsement and helps us with governments and investors in terms of um, well, you know, welcoming further investment uh, in the project. Uh, the other uh, big focus this year was the, the front end engineering design. So feasibility studies get you to about 10 or 15% engineering. Uh, before you can order long lead items, you need to, to do some uh, more detailed engineering. We're very happy with the results of that work. Uh, we increased increase the overall uh, NPV of the project, overall returns, um, and most importantly, uh, despite two the passing of two years in a period that was highly inflationary, you know, Des and our team did a great job managing the increase in capital costs, so just up a little bit, uh, 5% uh, to $2 billion uh, overall. Uh, the other major milestone that we've done uh, since we last talked uh, was the filing of the environment, federal environmental impact statement. Uh, this is actually a bit of a sad milestone. Kudos to our team to be reach it, but a little bit of a sad comment on the pace of Canadian mining development. Uh, the environmental impact statement that we filed, we are the first mining company uh, to file, to reach that second stage. Uh, we're the first mining company to reach that stage since this law has been in place since 2019. In order to, to go into that process, anything over 5,000 tons a day needs to go into that process. So, you know, it, we, hopefully a lot more projects are coming um, and be able to achieve that milestone. But uh, again, the, the words that have come out during the provincial election, the federal election, in terms of, um, you know, trying to get more critical minerals projects going uh, will be very welcome. Uh, on the financing front, uh, again, another key couple steps last fall, uh, Export Development Canada uh, agreed to provide a uh, letter of intent for 500 million US dollars of, of funding for the project. They agreed to be the mandated lead arranger. And what that means is they'll basically coordinate getting the entire debt facility uh, for us. Uh, and because Canada and EDC specifically funds a, a number of mining projects within the export credit agencies globally, they're seen as the mining leaders. And so that's a massive endorsement for the project. And we look forward to pushing forward on that uh, through this fall. Uh, on the carbon front, uh, again, we'll have some more announcements uh, on this coming up, coming up soon, and I'll talk about our downstream business and how that links in and, and how we're actually leveraging that carbon uh, capture potential that's there. So that's offered. Um, the other major focus last year, Agnico Eagle in January um, provided $35 million of exploration financing. Uh, we drilled about 130 kilometers of drilling. Uh, we've now successfully tested 18 deposits. Uh, we will uh, be publishing three additional resources this month, and before the end of the year, we'll be publishing another three. So we'll have nine resources, all within 100 kilometers uh, of Timmins. And you know, if we had more money, we could do more drilling and do do even more resources. You know, that's the scale of of what we have here. We'll be able to clearly demonstrate you know, that this is going to be the world's largest nickel sulfide endowment right here. Another area of focus for the company, I've, been, I've sort of talked a little bit about it, but really haven't talked about it in detail, but the activities in this area are really, really ramping up. Uh, the nickel business has been historically, you know, held captive to some extent by the oligopoly uh, of the historical, you know, handful of historical nickel smelters. Um, and so we'll be building our own nickel processing plant we also produce a nickel chrome magnetite product uh, that we'll be looking to convert uh, into stainless and alloy steels. I've been spending lots of time 
with European and US uh, steel companies uh, who are very excited uh, to have low cost, low carbon, uh, intermediate steel products that they can feed into the existing distribution networks. Um, so again, that's gonna be another very exciting step for the company, I'll talk about it um, in some more detail. Uh, nickel, uh, the death of nickel um, has been greatly exaggerated. Nickel demand continues to grow at 9% a year. You know, that's literally nine Crawfords per year that the world needs, and it's gonna continue at that pace for a period of time. Uh, Indonesia is now clearly the OPEC of nickel. The one country on their own controls more of the nickel market uh, than OPEC did of the oil market at its peak in the early 1970s. Um, you are going to see them, and, and we're in the midst of the first rounds of the battle right now between Indonesia and the Chinese producers in Indonesia about managing ore supply and pushing prices higher. So they've been a negative impact on the nickel market for the last 10 years. Now that they dominate global supply, it's in their country's interest, and you're going to see them you know, push, um, push prices higher, which will be hugely beneficial uh, because the deposits that we've unlocked and some of the other local companies have unlocked in this area are really the only new nickel, nickel discoveries globally outside of Indonesia. Um, again, you know, what's, what's contributed to our success, success to be able to rapidly advance all these projects you know, are the people in this room. Uh, you know, Timmins has this massive endowment of, of consultants, suppliers, and so forth that you know, everything we need to do to advance the project you know, is, is, is in this community. And so, you know, thank you for helping uh, make the company a success. Sorry, I'm moving around too much, maybe. Um, again, the scale of the operation, uh, just to, to remind everybody, you know, first quartile cash cost producer. You know, I hope my predecessor, and I don't think it'll be me, because I'll be 110 at that point, um, we'll be talking about 50 years uh, of, of operation, like the, the kid assets. Um, and what will anchor it is the fact that we're in the lowest quartile of the cost curve, lowest carb decile of the carbon curve. Uh, we're the second largest reserve, and we'd be the third largest nickel sulfide operation globally. Again, geopolitics being what it is today, unfortunately, you know, we're the Western world's, lar we'd be the Western world's largest nickel sulfide operation. The sound system is very excited about that as well. Because um, <laughs> those other two operations are in Russia and China, and uh, I don't think they're gonna be our friends again anytime soon. In, in terms of the district scale potential, the, you know, the great thing with these deposits is the geophysical footprint gives you 70% of the concept. So you know, our geological team, Steve Balch, Edwin Jen, uh, who's here, uh, you know, basically you know, came up with this targeting approach. We used the free data from the government um, and identified 20 targets in the region. Uh, we've drilled 18 of them. 10 of them are larger than Crawford. That's one thing you know, in terms of to take away from this uh, uh, presentation. Crawford is not our best project. Crawford will be our first project, um, but there is no one in our company who believes that Crawford is the best deposit. And I'll talk about some of the metrics of some of the other, other deposits that are here. When we really talk about having the potential for five or six mines in this area, basically cutting and pasting what we do at Crawford, you know, that is you know, what our company firmly, firmly believes. Uh, we bumped into some nice high grade, uh, and we expect to do that as we uh, continue to drill uh, around the area. But we had a 98% hit rate in terms of drilling. You know, what we want to hit and what we hit we've been able to do that 98% of the time. And again, that really underscores you know, how, how helpful the geophysics is. As I said, we're gonna have a total of nine resources um, in the area. You know, most junior companies have one good project. Most majors um, have, don't have nine projects in one particular commodity, but that's what we're gonna have at the end of this year um, here in the Timmins Nickel District. Just very visually, the, 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 the open pit on the right is what Crawford looks like. Uh, the pink is the target geophysical footprint. The resource and reserve clip very nicely to that. Crawford's a 2.3 to 1 strip ratio life of mine. The other deposit is reed. We've only drilled about half of it. Um, it's already got 4 billion tons or so in all categories in terms of a target. Um, if 
we drill that out the way we expect to drill it out, that will have a strip ratio of 0.5. We have several other, uh, the, we have the three giants that we refer to. Um, you know, th th this is the, the, the type of deposit, and this is just 10 kilometers west of the Kid Mine and about 17 kilometers southwest uh, of Crawford. Um, you know, these are the list of, of resources that will be published, as I said, three of them this month, um, and we've got lots of targets uh, to go. This is a chart I've used in various presentations from time to time. Uh, this is from a Valet presentation in 2015. Uh, each of those little dots on the chart is sulfide discoveries over time. Uh, back in 2015, Valet was highlighting the fact that if you look at you know, what's been discovered in the past 20 years, it's half the size of what was discovered back in the 1960s. Those big green dots are all of the Timmins deposits. So, you know, if you take us and Aston and EV Minerals, um, you know, we have already have more contained nickel resources in the ground than Sudbury has since it was, since it existed. Again, our recovery is lower, so we're going to have to get about double the contained value to get equivalent nickel tons, you know, but that really is the scale of what's out there um, in, in this district and that we're trying to unlock. The other dimension of these deposits is the fact that the rocks soak up CO2 spontaneously. Our IPT carbonation process, it is literally um, no more complicated than bubbling and stirring CO2 in some very specific process parameters that our team uh, developed in-house. We were applying for patents for this process globally, um, but that allows us to store a million and a half tons of CO2 per year, and each one of those 20 targets is hosted in the same kind of rock that has that carbon storage capacity. So when I talk to governments, what I talk about is really looking at North Northeast Ontario as a zero carbon industrial cluster, and, and that is really the opportunity there. Um, so, you know, what are we doing with the mine and the downstream? Um, we're basically uh, using a, a steel process uh, that allows us to very easily and simply capture the CO2, we compress it, we put it back in a pipeline, back up to the mine site, uh, and that allows us to capture all the CO2 that comes off the steel process. As a result, we end up with a steel product that has just over half a ton of CO2 per ton of steel, which would you know, categorize us as steel globally. And then the other opportunity in Timmins, there's a lot of biomass in this area, a lot of harvesting operations potential, and so, you know, we're looking to, to massively ramp up biochar production in this area. If we can use 40% of our reductant as biochar, then we get to a zero carbon steel. You know, there's companies all over the world spending billions of dollars trying to invent new technologies to make it happen. We're just repackaging existing technologies and taking advantage of our rocks capacity to store carbon uh, to make this happen. In terms of timeline, uh, we're pushing hard this year uh, to get our uh, permits in place by year end. Uh, we're working with our partners, Scotia and Deutsche Bank uh, and Cutfield Freeman to get the full funding package uh, together and we'd like to make a construction decision by year end. We probably won't be able to do a big, big push this winter, unfortunately, because we needed to order long lead items uh, earlier this year. But you know, in, in the next 15 months, you know, we expect to, to ramp up and, and be in production by 2027, 2028. So thank you for your time. Thanks for coming out to here and uh, glad to answer any questions. Thank you.